So introductions are always really, really awkward. So I won't waste a lot of time doing that. Hi, I'm Nick. Welcome to this attempt at a YouTube channel. Uh, most of it will be me giving my thoughts and kind of lecture style on what I think is important in the discipline of New Testament theology. Uh, if you're looking for really slick and uh, competent video production, uh, you should go look and watch at Capturing Christianity where Cameron Bertuzzi does his thing and does it well. Uh, I'm a pretty terrible film student. I did my undergrad in film and I don't know the first thing about it. So uh, there you go. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what New Testament theology is and what I hope to accomplish with this meager attempt at a YouTube channel. So pardon me real quick. So New Testament theology. First off, it is not what you see uh, being currently bandied about on social media with the second edition. Uh, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology is not uh, New Testament theology. It is not a, uh, how should I put this very nicely? A, uh, well, it's digital now, but it's not a printed copy of a list of Bible verses kind of cobbled together to form what is argued as the obvious conclusion of what all these verses clearly teach. So systematic theology is not about proof texting. Systematic theology is more than that or it shouldn't even be proof texting, but it's so much more than that. New Testament theology is also not just counting verses and finding things that work together or you think fit in that sort of sense. New Testament theology is a much more integrative and uh, artistic discipline. It is not a hard science. Of course, much of theology is not a a science, or at least in what we often think of science, it's not like chemistry or biology or anything like that. Although it does have scientific approaches and kind of things that give it a sense of um, normalcy within that sort of range. So you could call it an art and a science, but I, I tend to think of it as more art, an art, a scientific exercise, uh, rather an artistic exercise with some scientific backbone. So uh, Frank Matera, who's a, a really brilliant New Testament scholar teaches, I want to say at Catholic University of America, or I believe it's that, I could be wrong. Uh, he published an article in the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, and the article is really good. It's called uh, New Testament Theology, uh, History, Method, and Identity. And he basically points out that New Testament theology really didn't exist, and I'm paraphrasing, really didn't exist until the Protestant Reformation. And it's kind of a Protestant exercise, or he would say, maybe a better way of saying it is a Protestant dominated exercise. Frank Matera, of course, has written a New Testament theology, and there have been other uh, uh, Catholic theologians who have done things like that. And so it's, it's dominated by the Protestant sphere. So New Testament theology, if you, if you Google it or you hop on Amazon or something like that, you'll find books by, say, Tom Schreiner or, um, or I. Howard Marshall, May He Sleep in Peace. You may even find books uh, by Peter Stillmacher of, uh, I don't want to get the university wrong, but a brilliant German New Testament scholar. Uh, but it's, it's by and large a, a Protestant kind of exercise. And that's not to say it's right or wrong. That's just kind of where it is. So it is, it has a historical particularity and a historical pedigree to it, which is kind of nice. And so the thing is, and this is a debate, is if you read scripture as scripture, that by that I mean scripture has authority in the life of the church, scripture has a say in how you live your life, and so on and so forth, then you're going to read scripture differently than, say, someone who reads, uh, reads, script, reads the Bible or the New Testament in this example, and the through the lens of historical, uh, well, that would be historical criticism because Christians do that. It'd be kind of the history of religion school, right? It's uh, it's read more for socio-historical kind of content versus theological content. Not to say that the two are opposed to each other, but you prioritize one instead of the other or over the other. And Matera writes, Frank Matera writes, for those who ascribe scriptural status to the writings of the New Testament. Uh, or the NT, the task of New Testament theology should be bolder since it is incongruous for a discipline that identifies its writings as scripture, bearing witness to God's revelation to be indifferent about their inner coherence. 
New Testament theology then should seek to provide a theological interpretation of the New Testament that integrates and relates the diverse theologies of the New Testament into a unified whole without harmonizing them as elusive as that task might be. That's on page uh, 16. Uh, and he wrote this article in 2005. And of course, there are four, there's many ways of doing that. But the key point that he, the key phrase that we might want to just focus on just for a few minutes is uh, a theological interpretation of the New Testament. Now, that is, of course, a disputed phrase right there. Uh, theological interpretation uh, has many different ways of being understood, or many people understand it in different ways. I uh, tend to follow Joel Green and others that theological interpretation is reading the Bible uh, in, a, in two ways, and very basic, reading it in two ways. First, you're reading it as a Christian. So it already has, as Matera pointed out, a scriptural component, a, a value beyond just history. It's something far much more. It's, we would say it's God's word to us. And the second would be, uh, so I mentioned God's word to us, theological. Oh, um, reading scripture for formation. There's a, a spiritual component that has an impact on your life. And so uh, those two things are kind of bedrock assumptions within the theological interpretation method, which I ascribe to very strongly. I'm a Christian. I, I'm going to read things Christianly. That's just how that goes. That's not to say I don't do history or try to do history or try and be objective. But at the end of the day, as someone who believes in the Christian God, I'm going to read things through that lens. And I don't expect other people to fall in line with that. I, that's, just who, that's just what I am in, as of right now. Uh, and so uh, uh, theological interpretation of the New Testament, and this is the key point here, that integrates and relates the diverse theologies of the New Testament into a unified whole without harmonizing them. So you have two kind of interesting phrases there, unified whole, and harmonizing. So how do these two kind of pieces or disparate elements relate to one another, right? And uh, it's an, as Matera said, it's elusive. And so for example, you'll see in Tom Schreiner's work, uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but New Testament theology, magnifying God in Christ or something like that, where he takes a very thematic approach. What is the New Test? What do the New Testament authors say about God? What do they say about Jesus? And you kind of you kind of have a theme here and you bring all the evidence and kind of put it into that. And then you kind of begin your construction. Whereas others begin more with uh, Howard Marshall's approach. I Howard Marshall's approach was essentially to go, what does Mark say about um, all these different things and kind of do smart, start small, but Mark is a brick and the wall of New Testament theology. Then you have Matthew and Luke Acts and the Johannian literature and so on and so forth. And these are kind of like bricks that you build upon each other. And so those are two ways that people kind of have tended to do New Testament theology, at least within kind of the evangelical sphere. Um, and Matera gives, I think, five, there we, there we go. Oh, that's not five, but he gives, so there's talk, there's debates about the method of New Testament theology, right? So for example, do you take, do you go in a canonical order, you know, to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth? Do you kind of start from there? Or do you start with what you believe to be the earliest literature, the earliest documents, uh, which might be um, Galatians for some, First Thessalonians for some, probably within the Pauline literature. Uh, I, I would personally bet on Paul being the earliest writer quite strongly. But then, of course, you have to go even further in that because you have issues of not only oral tradition or even Q, if you believe in the existence of Q, or even uh, early what we might call creedal fragments, say first, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, verses, you know, let's say 1 to 7 or 3 to three to 5, depending on how you, how you splice it up, you know. Or even perhaps uh, Romans uh, 1, 3 to 5, you know, ideas like that, where these, these verses have kind of a creedal or hymnic element that seem to suggest that maybe Paul's getting them from somewhere, which may suggest that he got them from people before him, you know. So there's even stuff before that. And so there's those two kind of ways you go. Uh, the canonical way, which was uh, Brevard Child's kind of preferred method, although he was also very thematic uh, in how he constructed. So he was very much a both and theologian. I believe he taught at Yale. Uh, I want to say, I can't remember if it's Yale University or Yale Divinity School. Either way, I believe he's passed away. If he hasn't, well, then, hi, Dr. Charles. Uh, hopefully this, uh, you don't see this. Um, but either way, you get a sense in which 
the, so how do you even begin to do that process, right? So the method, do you go canonically or do you go um, what you believe in terms of historical particularity, what was written first? And that's a healthy debate. And I think there's value in both of them. I, I don't find either way to be very strong in terms of what I must prefer as a New Testament guy. Uh, my preference, I think, would be on the to err on the historical side, where if Paul is the earliest writer, then you start with Paul, and then you begin to see how things operate. And if you do that, then you find some interesting things, because I would argue Mark has Pauline, Mark feels like maybe he's read Paul, and I would argue John probably has read a little bit of Paul, or at least maybe knows a little bit of Paul just in terms of how they write and how they think epistemologically and all that. But that's, of course, debated. Um, so there's kind of that method question, you know, how do you do that? And do you include uh, the, uh, the Deuteropaulines, right? You know, Colossians, Ephesians, the pastorals, so on and so forth. Um, do you include, um, uh, do, you know, when do you date things? Do you date Luke Acts to the bef before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, or do you date it to the second century? Same with the pastoral, same with second Peter, right? And so there are questions of how you even begin to kind of construct this. You need to do the historical work, which is why I lean towards the historical thing or the historical kind of idea. If you do that, then you've got a really good grasp on kind of the particularity of these theological works and it kind of forces you to do history. Um, but there's more that could be said on that, but I wanna keep this as short as possible. Uh, and the second, another thing that uh, Matera mentions is the message of Jesus in a New Testament theology. And it's kind of famous that uh, Rudolf Bultmann, he points out, and I noticed this too when I was reading Bultmann, a uh, famous German New Testament scholar. Basically, the, uh, there's not really much to be said about Jesus in, in terms of what Jesus actually said. It's not as if G we have the words of Jesus kind of thing. Um, so you can't. So Jesus is, is dispensable for New Testament theology. What matters is what did Paul say about Jesus? What did John say about Jesus? And so on and so forth. And so um, even then you need to begin uh, kind of the idea of how all this works. And so again, you're, you're pushed back to the historical particularity of the New Testament, the of New Testament theology and the entire enterprise. And I think the biggest debate for me, and this is something I hope to kind of pursue in this channel, um, not exclusively, I have a lot of other things I'd like to do, but the big thing that's emphasized is the unity and diversity in New Testament theology. James D.G. Dunn, who's since passed on the glory, uh, wrote a couple, a pretty short book, maybe a hundred or two pages on that specific topic. Um, and uh, Matera writes, and I think this is very, very valuable. Uh, and this is page 20. From the point of view of the historian, the, the unity of the New Testament is a presupposition that must be proved. So you actually have to prove that these documents, these disparate documents written over, maybe if Paul wrote in 30, 35, 40, or even 45, and then maybe the, the final New Testament document, the book of Revelation, or Second Peter, if Second Peter, if Peter wrote Second Peter or had it, or had a hand in Second Peter, maybe 80, 90, depending on how you date things, and if you believe uh, the authors wrote them. And that, of course, depends on, you know, do you, if they did or did not write them, how much value do you put on those for the working out of New Testament theology? So things like that. Um, but uh, he points out that from the point of view of the believer, however, you remember theological interpretation of scripture or of the New Testament in, in my case, uh, the unity of the New Testament is a pre presupposition of faith. I don't know how much I like that phrase, but I get what he's communicating. Faith, he says, faith presupposes that the diverse writings of the New Testament witness to the same reality, even though faith may not be immediately, may not immediately comprehend or articulate how these workings are related to each other. And so maybe a, an example to kind of wind all this down. You have New Testament theology is concerned about two things, and this is true of exegetical work as a whole, but this is part and parcel of doing New Testament theology because New Testament theology essentially looks at the words, uh, the syntax, you know, the literary context and history and the history of interpretation, how these, how the New Testament documents have been interpreted and received throughout the 2000 years of church history. And they kind of go, okay, how does all of this inform everything, you know? My New Testament theology goes, here you have Paul, and not even Paul, you have 1 Thessalonians Paul, and 1 Timothy Paul, right? And how do they speak to each other? Do, do they mesh nicely, or do they kind of sort of intertwine, or do they just, they bump in heads? And, my, and to my mind, I think 
if we take history seriously, you're going to find goofy particular things that aren't easily explained. But that also doesn't give us grounds, I think, for undue skepticism where we go up oh, there. Uh, Paul says this here and Paul says that there. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't mesh the two. You can't harmonize it. You can't make sense of it. I don't buy that either. If there's a good explanation, there's a good explanation. But the concern we have as New Testament theologians uh, is don't get so caught up in the weeds of the forest that you miss the atmosphere. You're concerned both with the atmosphere, the 30,000 foot view of scripture of Mark and Paul and Peter and John. And you're also concerned with the weeds, their historical location, their silly things they say, the goofy things they write. Um, you're concerned with the complexities of syntax and word choice and stuff like that. And once you kind of get all of that kind of taken care of, uh, you begin to see there's a huge world that you're allowed to play in, right? And for the believer, uh, as I am, that is a very fruitful and powerful enterprise that is just waiting to be explored. So you're not supposed to get caught in the weeds and you're not supposed to be so high up that you miss the ground. So weeds and atmosphere, weeds and atmosphere. You need both to do New Testament theology right. So Welcome to the New Testament Theologist. Uh, I've not been supervised for this entire time. Yeah. And thank you for watching. If you like this, do the normal thing, I guess, is what you kids do. Like, subscribe, share. Um, I'm on Twitter. You can click one of the thingies. I don't know, it's on the page. You can click the thingy and follow me on Twitter. Um, if you try to find me on Facebook, sorry, if I don't know you, I don't do any of that. So anyways, uh, blessings to you. Thank you for taking the time to watch this and uh, try to have a happy new year. Try, try to have a happy new year. Yeah. <laughs>